Um, right, so hi everyone. Thanks so much for coming to our talk and hi to those watching on the live stream. Uh, my name is Kaylin Smith. I'm from Cambridge University Library presenting with Stephen McConaughey from the BFI. And we're going to talk to you today about an initiative that we're involved with in the UK about preserving UK video game heritage. Um, so this is going really well so far, being you know, tasked with this massive challenge and not being able to work our slides, but we're going to give it a try. Um, and if we did collect video games, what would this look like? Um, what does it mean to collect, preserve, provide access to games? Um, and yeah, and hopefully we'll get some feedback from the audience as well because this is very much early days uh, and we're just really trying to understand the universe at the moment. Okay, so I mean, it, what it says on screen really, we're just going to talk you through these component parts. Um, why is it a challenge? Why is it complex? Um, what we're doing about it, and then we, we have a, a worked case study, you might call it, to talk you through and then possibly talk about next steps. Oops. So, the BFI is the British Film Institute, but we are the National Television Archive and the National Film Archive, and really the BFI's mission is to reflect the art history and impact of the moving image. So video games are, are in, our, in scope for our consideration. We, we're aware that in the UK there's lots of national and de facto national and um, specific collections with video games also in scope. So we decided it would be much more useful and effective to, to gang up on the problem. So we, we called everyone we knew to have a vested interest in for a discussion. Um, and there's a lot, uh, so they're on there, uh, British Library, Tate, v &A, Science Museum, and there's a, there's a um, British Games Institute which runs a, a games museum in Sheffield. If you're ever in Sheffield, which you know, I recommend, it's an amazing city, you should take a look at that. It uh, used to be called the Video Games Arcade, I believe. So we gathered them around and we discussed how would this work? What would a distributed national collection of, of video games look like? because that's really what it is. It's a national collection of games in many organizations with different collecting uh, remits and mandates and agendas and focuses. Uh, so we decided that really the problem could be conceived as three separate problems potentially. So we formed subgroups, preservation and access and advocacy and strategy. And advocacy and strategy turn out to be very similar. So preservation and access turns out to be distinct, I think. So Caelan and I are going to really talk about the uh, preservation and access. Um, right, so these are some uh, challenges that have come up within the remit of the wider group. Um, so how do we go about defining a work? So um, is it the software, is it the hardware, peripherals? Um, how do you document or capture fan culture to understand the context in which a video game existed? Um, also, to this challenge of shifting to gaming as a service and the impact of not being able to collect any sort of physical media. And I think this is something not just within um, video game preservation, um, but a challenge for the digital preservation community in general, the shift to software as a service um, in terms of preserving software and software-based works. Um, we haven't really been able to tap into other networks that are um, preserving video games yet, so that's something that we're really keen to do and to understand who's collecting games at the moment, especially outside the UK, and are the challenges that we've already identified solved? Um, we also want to know about uh, preservation work that's happening outside the context of collecting organizations, so um, understanding the impact of heavily proprietary um, uh, commercial companies, but also to ones that have presumably been able to solve um, some preservation challenges with um, being able to monetize their back catalogs, for example. Um, so how can we tap into this knowledge? Is that even possible to begin with? And have these companies solve preservation um, challenges already? We're also interested um, with what the pirate community is doing, and especially around emulation um, and metadata schemas. Um, but we've identified here a risk of getting involved, but also not getting involved, and could getting involved with the um, pirate community uh, antagonize rights holders or compromise um, our funding opportunities, etc. 
Um, another challenge that we've identified is knowing or anticipating what users want to access. I think that plays a really big role in deciding what we're going to collect to begin with. Um, so these are some points of some challenges that have come up within the specific context of our preservation and access subgroup. Um, kind of going back to what I just said, deciding what we're going to collect. Um, and I think with more complex um, objects, um, there are more things that we could be collecting. Um, as Stephen was mentioning before too, uh, fit within the organization's collecting uh, policy and remit. Um, what is actually achievable and sustainable with workplace skills and infrastructure. So we might want to collect video games, um, but can we support these games um, when we do collect them? Um, and going back to the point earlier too about access, so what we can collect and preserve might not be the actual format that um, our users want to look at and engage with. Um, also looking at how to create the bigger picture, so this idea of distributed collecting. Um, so if one organization wanted to collect one part of the game and another um, to collect another part of the game, how could we link these two things together and, and build this national collection of video games? Um, challenges to have communicating uh, complexities to government and other funding bodies. Uh, also looking at engaging with industries and makers, this whole idea of um, have commercial companies solve the challenges that we've identified. And this idea too that came up around an orphan works license for video games, so like how it exists for film and sound, um, would that be possible for games as well? So uh, we made a very basic version of the matrix we're going to talk about, and if you're interested in taking a look at that, it's, I mean, it's a very simple grid spreadsheet, so don't get too excited, but there's the URL. Um, and you can take it and use it and change it and improve it and send us the better version of that. That would be amazing. Um, so obligatory, you know, if you're going to talk about a matrix, you have to quote from the matrix. It's quite, a, it's quite pertinent, though, really, because we are, going to take, we are going to take the red pill today and go massively deep into the horrible rabbit hole of what collecting video games might look like. Um, but, you know, it was an option to take the blue pill. We took the red. So um, we're going to talk you through what the matrix we've defined looks like, uh, why it might be useful, how broad it is. Um, uh, just before we get into it, here is the... The case study we're going to use, it's called Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice. It's by a British gaming company called Ninja Theory. And I have to thank Ninja Theory for being so open and helpful and supplying us with materials to use and giving us permission to stream them to the internet. Um, Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice, you'll see a mass of stuff that you can look up. I recommend you take a look at their uh, developer diaries in particular. It's a, kind of astounding to me. Um, so yeah, we're going to walk you through the matrix, I mean our matrix, um, and, and model this as a case study. Uh, right, so one of the categories we have is hardware, so the physical device that outputs the video signal um, to display the game. Uh, in regards to Hellblade, uh, it's created for P um, PC, then PS4, then Xbox, and Nintendo Switch. Um, and then the PC and the PS4 versions have a VR component to them as well. Uh, source code, so um, Ninja Theory is a UK-based developer, so um, they're the rights holder. Um, but do we know yet, um, which we don't, if they've preserved all of their source code or retained all their source code? And if we were to collect this, would we have the knowledge um, at one of our organizations to understand it? Uh, so release code, so the executable file is uh, interpreted by the console. Um, so for Hellblade, it's physically rele released on a disk, and then updates are, um, are typically not. They're pushed out um, over the internet. And this is more common when playing uh, disk-based games. <clears throat> right, so the other one, our next category being patch notes, so documentation of updates released alongside the update uh, on different platforms. Uh, so Hellblade, it's released um, on their Hellblade website mainly. Uh, so for Hellblade, there's no um, downloadable content, but this is another category that we've included in our matrix because we know it exists for other games. 
Uh, we're also interested in packaging for a game. Um, so this would be, for example, the case for the cover, um, any sorts of instructions that come along with the game, if there's any sort of physical booklet as well. Gameplay accessories. Um, so I mentioned before the Hellblade, some of the um, uh, versions have uh, VR specific components. So the, the really is a myriad of hardware and peripherals and bolt-ons and plug-ins and additions. And it was quite, um, I'm not a games expert by any means. I mean, I'm not really a video or film expert either, but I'm definitely not a games expert. So when we started exploring this, we have to say a big thanks to Stuart Burnside in the BFI, who works in our uh, certification unit. And what does that mean? The BFI certifies films and television and video games for tax benefit. If you're British, according to the BFI's cultural test, um, then you, you get tax relief and it benefits your, obviously, your bottom line. So, so we have a certification unit who certify video games and Stuart Burnside who works in there is, I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine anyone who knows more about video games than Stuart. So he un opened this kind of rabbit hole, matrix rabbit hole of things and I was quite amazed and, and uh, astounded. I also found it quite liberating that if you're collecting video games, there are many things you can do to collect video games. I started with thinking, well, it must be the source code and the executable, that is the video game. And Stuart was like, well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe in 100 years you don't want that, because maybe people want to see what video games looked like in the old days when they were different. So anyway, one of the things you could acquire are these. Um, uh, power boosts and resolution boosts for hardware and, and it's not relevant for modern games so much but if you get deep into the uh, back catalogue of games then these are things you would want to consider. Um, so from here on it, it, it starts to get for me quite interesting because video games create a lot of surrounding content and it's really rich content. It's actually amazed me with this case study because I've done a lot of viewing of their content online. The ecosystem that the makers surround this game with is fascinating and super rich. And I recommend if you're remotely interested in games, check out the Ninja Theory Hellblade website. It's, it really took me by surprise. So market materials, press kits, trailers, websites, downloadable wallpapers for your devices. I don't have a Hellblade wallpaper, but some guys would. Um, all of the above for Hellblade. I'm just gonna show you some of it real, really briefly. Um, you have downloadable wallpapers, you have posters that you can download and print out. You have musical soundtracks, even released on vinyl. Um, oh, that's amazed me. There's, there's such a lot of content to support this game's world and its users. Um, I was gonna play the trailer, but we're running a bit late, so if you're interested, you can look up the trailer. It's very rich. Um, Collectibles and ephemera, amazingly to me, you can collect hoodies and posters and scented candles. I mean, seriously, the, the stuff you can collect to, to collect video games is, it really is a spectrum, a huge broad spectrum of things. Um, design documentation, Stuart made the case that a lot of game makers are creating incredibly rich and detailed, uh, visually rich and detailed technically descriptions of the process um, and Ninja Theory uh, have a website where they publish developer diaries and you can follow the game's design steps almost from concept to release and uh, again if you're interested I recommend you take a look at that it's really amazing um, they have films about the music composing films about the animation etc etc character modeling um, Fan produced materials, also very rich. I learned a lot about cosplay when I was researching this. There's plentiful cosplay, and the makers even created a guide to the design of the character, just to give you a head start. This is how these makers engage their communities, and let's not forget the, the market and the audience for video games outstrips the market and the audience for film and television by massive. And I, I think I can see how they do that, because they're creating so much content to engage their audiences. Um, Walkthroughs and guides, hints and tips, here's what to do when you meet uh, this challenge, etc. There's lots of that. Um, there's professionally produced, IGN is a big maker, and then there's fan produced. And again, you could collect all or some or none of it. Um, 
Gameplay footage. This is massive. Stuart explained to me this is almost as big as buying and playing the game. People tune in to watch experts play the game. Um, I found that counterintuitive, but he said, emphasised how big a deal it is. It's really important to the community. Um, and for us as the BFI, we're moving image archive. So potentially, I mean, not to sound lazy, but potentially if we acquire the gameplay footage on a uh, FFE1 Matroska, potentially my work is done. <laughs> um, so just to, to round up some next steps, um, we are developing with this group of, uh, you know, a consortium maybe, we are developing a formal network. Uh, subject specialist network. In the UK you can form this network and then it allows you to bid for funding to host events and do activities and research and so on. Um, and as Kaylin said, we're hoping to uh, recruit maybe from globally to, to learn from other nations who are doing similar work and I know the Australians have just uh, announced a, a, an initiative to acquire and collect video games. Um, pirate community. Now there's some risk, as Kaylin said, because we are government-funded organisations and they are on the edges of the law. Um, however, they're miles ahead in every domain. They have metadata schemas for video game artefacts that are incredibly developed and detailed. I'm told, I haven't spoken to them, of course. Um, <laughs> um, but it's a real question for us. Should we? Must we? And one of the membership says we must. If we don't, they'll do it better and they're miles ahead. So I feel we must. We just have to work out with government's help how we do that. Um, and, and keep going with our matrix and develop it and test it. Test it with older games, test it with different games. Um, and then we have the idea of creating a data model for video games based on the matrix to kind of document how you would describe it in your collections database, for example, how you would speak about it to your peers and your donors. and. Feedback, we, we want feedback on our ideas and the matrix, our matrix. Um, I think that's it. So we're probably out of time for questions maybe, but uh, thanks very much. David Pfluger, um, have, there's, there's not a phenomenon coming from, from kind of remotely the game scene, which is called the demo scene. People who program essentially video clips challenging the capabilities of the machine they're working with. Uh, it's not interactive in that sense, but they, they are not recordings like a, a video clip, but they are program-based visuals and audio. Have you come across this? And is that something that would also fall into the scope of your project? Yeah, that will be on the matrix before I leave the building. Thanks very much. <laughs> we, I haven't come across it, but as I said, I'm, I'm no one's idea of an expert. Um, but I'll have to rely on people who are, so thank you very much. We'll, we'll add it and I'll talk to Stuart and see what it means for, for the collecting. Thank you. A, a few quick observations from someone who's been working in this space for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, though it seems intuitive that the most important thing is getting people to be able to play the games, actually, when you look at it, there are huge scholars, historians, there's a much larger group of people who just wants to see how the games were played. Right. And I like your idea of taking things from Twitch and, you know, but the, the, you have to be careful because those are the champion game players. Um, and the idea of recording um, normal game players and how they play, I think, is very right. important. Um, uh, okay, okay, real, real quick. Um, uh, as far as the game itself, emulators run the game a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. So the whole pacing is wrong. And the other uh, critical thing with, uh, with trying to do the game, as you kind of referred to, uh, the peripherals end up being the hardest thing. How do, how do you interface with the game? Sure. Yep. 
you give me the fear when you describe it so clearly, but yeah, you're absolutely right, I think. Hi, uh, Lorde again. Um, I, I, I'm a big gamer. I, see, I miss two things here, the modding community and the online uh, part, because the example you gave is a single player game. It's easily packaged. Mm -hmm. Everything is in one executable. It's in one file. But for instance, if I'm talking about a media artist from Belgium uh, called Tale of Tales, they'll make uh, a game called uh, Endless Forest which is a multiplayer game. Mm -hmm. you, if you enter the game alone, there is nothing, there's no game. There is mm -hmm. <laughs> so what are your ideas for um, online games? Because most of the games that are published, that are online only, after a couple of years, the publisher removes the server, and then the whole game is gone. Of and there's, there's no disc, there was never a physical release. Now, of course, it's a key challenge, and I'm not claiming I have a solution or even have the start of the sketch of the idea of a solution, but I guess one way to solve that is to settle for gameplay recording. So in some cases, you may have to settle for a recording because realistically, how achievable it is to make a meaningful preservation of something that exists on a server that the rights holder is never going to give you access to. So we also have to be pragmatic as well as idealist. And um, so I'm sorry I don't have a better answer. Okay, we're up. Thanks very much. <laughs>